David Schnarch, I'm very happy to meet you here in the publisher house of Kletkotta in Stuttgart. You are a psychologist, you are director of the Crucible Institute for Marriage and Family Center in Colorado, the United States. You have always written um, several books, but one of them, Psychologie Sexueller Leidenschaften, had been always already published by Klett, Klett Cotta. And now there's a new book, which is Intimacy and Desire, Awaken the Patient in Your Relationship. Your book differs from comparable books by, of other consultants because you detail theoretical statements that are not only illustrated by the partner stories, but you find an inter interesting twist, I think, in order to use the reports of your clients as a starting point to precise your theoretical statements. In my review on the blog, I mentioned some of the main ideas of your book. The subtitle, Awaken the Patient Relationships, sums up the concern of your book. Your book is intended for all, and the reports of your clients is intended for all. You are convinced that all the normal people will sooner or later have problems with the sexual behavior. Is this right? Absolutely. This, what makes intimacy and desire unique, it is the first explanation why normal healthy couples have sexual desire problems. And up until this point, the only way that people have been able to understand why they have sexual desire problems is to think that something is going wrong, like they've fallen out of love, or they are sexually incompatible, or they picked the wrong partner, or they have irreconcilable differences. But uh, normal healthy couples do have sexual desire problems, mm -hmm. but couples get divorced according to their expectations. And when you believe that sexual desire is a normal function, and then the only way that you can explain why you have the same problems everybody else does is to postulate something wrong, you are much more likely to become a divorce statistic. Yeah. So not only does this approach help couples have better sex and maintain sexual desire, it also helps them become more resilient, stop feeling bad about themselves, stop hiding in shame, and feel some proud about going through the same problems that everybody does. And so it helps couples, it helps families, and uh, we're just really so proud that Klee Kata has given us the opportunity yes, to yes. bring our work to Germany. Yes. You tell, <clears throat> I th you think the common solution finding is a real task for the couples in the first place. I suppose that you think that um, her problem is not only listlessness. Oh, if the problem was just listlessness, there would be far fewer people that have sexual desire problems. Mm -hmm. From research that now we have running statistics with, in cooperation with Cleet Kata, we have over 2,000 German responses that mm -hmm. says well over 55%, over half of couples here in Germany have sexual desire problems and that means that statistically they're normal and we now offer them a picture that explains why the problems that nobody thinks will happen to them happens to everybody. Mm -hmm. I have found two main ideas in for the approach of your book. First, the couple have to understand that in a relationship there's always a weak and a strong partner and that the partner with the weak desires is controlling the sex. Do your clients always accept this point of view? Uh, what is remarkable is uh, I can go anywhere in the world and talk about the idea that the low desire partner always controls sex and everybody always starts nodding and they understand. But to make sure that there's no problem because of language translation, uh, you said it as there's a weak partner and a strong partner. Uh, what we're saying is, no, these partners are equal. Mm -hmm. So there, it isn't that there's a strong partner and a weak partner. Mm -hmm. It's that there is a lower desire partner and a higher desire mm -hmm. partner. So as long as we know that what we're talking about when we talk about stronger mm -hmm. and weaker is not stronger and weaker personality, we're talking about, about desire. 
<laughs> that yes, in every couple, there is a partner who wants sex mm -hmm. more than the other. But the same could be true for intimacy, mm -hmm. or the same could be true for having a child, yeah. or buying a house, or buying a Porsche, or spending money. And so what really makes the approach attractive to couples is it doesn't just pertain to sexual desire. And so one person could be the high desire partner mm -hmm. for sex and the low desire partner for intimacy mm -hmm. or vice versa. And once we know whether you are the lower desire partner or the higher desire partner, we can tell you what are the ridiculous things that you're going to say when you're having a fight with your partner yes. about sex. Yeah. And it's neutral. It's not about family of origin. It's not about um, that it's male or female. So, mm -hmm. for instance, half the couples that we see with sexual desire problems, the man is the low desire partner. So it's not about a gender difference, and the high desire partner is not always male. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, people don't anticipate that. But there are so many couples that have sexual desire problems where the woman is the high desire partner, their ears pick up because you never ever hear that. Yeah. The, couples whose problems, the couples whose problems you present seems to be selected or designed for your chapters. But typical cases does not exist because there are always too much differences. Anyway, the reader will find themselves in all pairs in any form. The stories of the couples are an illustration, or do you think that their, that their um, solution could be a model for your readers? Um, 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 the, the, the solution which, which you describe could be a model for your readers. Oh, yes, yes. In, in fact, what we tell people is that uh, in every chapter there is an in-depth mm -hmm. case of a couple struggling with the problems we all have. And it's not uncommon for people to come and talk with me and say, I'm just like the, the couple that's in chapter two and in chapter five. So there's a piece of this that fits <laughs> and a piece of that that fits. And virtually everybody mm -hmm. can find pieces of all these cases. And that's why it's so helpful. So uh, it's not like each kind of problem is mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. And so, so many people find that there are a tremendous number of aspects that there are solutions that help them. It's very, very broad. When you tell us about Robert and Sally, about the problems of the transfer function or a borrowed, borrowed psychology function, which all its consequences, which seems to be a key passage in your book, I have written on the blog that this passage deals with the effects on the other partner and on the sense of the self, of the sense of self. Robert and Sally are in the background, and you as psychologists provide interesting insights into the psyche. Psyche, nicht? Psyche. 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 Yes. Could you explain this problem with the transfer function? Yes. We call it borrowed functioning. Yeah. So very often uh, what happens is one partner's functioning is transferred to the other. Mm -hmm. So they may be equal, but what happens is, for instance, uh, the woman may be the support for the man, the man's functioning goes up, and in the process the woman's functioning goes down because they are trading selfhood, and then the man from this a supported position, which is borrowed functioning, he thinks that belongs to him. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't. It's a function of the relationship. And so eventually, then he makes the mistake of coming to his wife and saying, I have outgrown you. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, th that, that is the mistake. So when the relationship falls apart, w w when they divorce, very often the man's functioning goes down, the man's functioning goes up, except mm -hmm. if he starts dating his secretary. Mm -hmm. So then very often he switches his borrowed functioning from dependence on the wife to dependence on the, on the secretary. And that's why he stops five years down the road, he stops having sex with his secretary, just mm -hmm. like he stopped having mm -hmm. sex with his wife. Yeah. Yeah, yes. and. Women do not like having sex with men that they have to prop up all the time. Mm -hmm. So there's one aspect to the borrowed functioning that may look good, but it invariably kills sex. Yeah. You, you recommend this joint solution of sexual problems. This is, of course, not you, but you are not content with observations and advices. 
You offer explanations and you explain the effects about differentia differentiation in binding and self-regulation. Right. You confirm that these processes are to be understood in terms of development and need to change. Could you precise your point of view, especially the terms of binding and self-regulation? Uh, I think by binding and self-regulation, what, you, what you're talking about is self-soothing. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's yes. binding. And um, uh, unfortunately, up to now, most people believe that you're supposed to get your soothing from your partner. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a very common belief, and that's why it's very common to have sexual desire problems. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize that it's the common belief that causes sexual desire problems. You're always looking for what is uniquely wrong with you. Most people never think it's the way I'm just like everybody else that's causing the sexual desire problems. Mm -hmm. So very often when couples come together, they are coming together not just out of love, but they have difficulty functioning as a whole person on their own. And they think, well, if two half people get yeah. together, yeah. then uh, we will become one whole person. Yeah. And then the difficulty is who's going to drive that car? Who's going yes. to drive the system? And so then couples start fight, fighting about that. Yes. But what, what marriage teaches you, and when I talk about marriage, I don't mean the legal institution, I mean all emotionally committed relationships. When you are dependent on your partner's validation, when you need them to tell you that you're wonderful, if you need them to apologize every time there's an argument and you can't soothe yourself, you need your partner to say that they are wrong, it kills sex. And yes. you muck around until you learn to stand on your own two feet. Mm. And the big surprise is people think if couples can stand on their own two feet and they don't need each other, they will separate when neediness is what keeps couples together, that is what drives you together at the beginning and then kills sex and drives you apart. And yes. lo and behold, you find that marriage teaches you to learn to handle your own anxiety yes. and to soothe your own emotions and to lick your own wounds. And lo and behold, that is what makes you attractive to a partner. Yeah. And then the sex gets better. And the other thing is it's good preparation for being a parent, particularly mm -hmm. if you're going to have adolescents. Because an adolescent will also force you to learn to soothe yourself and calm yourself down. And your children will make you nervous. And then you have to develop the four points of balance that mm -hmm. we talk about in intimacy and desire as yeah. well. Even if one is certainly familiar with all questions of intimacy, what one can find in your book many insights that they are worth thinking about new ways to open up. You recommend at the beginning the partners should read this book on their own. The partners will certainly be inter interpreted in different ways, each of these pages. What, what is, oh, you mean later couples there? Yes. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, it, it certainly can. Uh, m marriage was not invented so a therapist could send his ki children to college. Mm -hmm. So marriage is not predicated on having a therapist. That's one of the beautiful things about the book Intimacy and Desire. It talks about how marriage is the teacher. It is the therapy. Going through marriage is what makes us capable of solving the problems mm -hmm. that we've created. So, uh, certainly, uh, there are many couples who could read Passionate mm -hmm. Marriage uh, and, and Intimacy and Desire, and no, they don't need a therapist. Mm -hmm. But it works very well because those that don't need it don't go on to have a therapist, and the couples that do read Intimacy and Desire and they find that it isn't enough, they not only can find the therapist, but they also end up with a good idea of the yeah. kind of therapist they want to see. Yeah. I have two more questions. Yeah. Oh, your main thesis, the desire fades when you cease to develop, is a logical conclusion from the first two parts of, the book, of, of your book. Can we, deliver, can we develop the craving? What does you recommend to the partners? Oh. The idea of developing craving is a very interesting idea because generally up to now, people think of desire as a biological drive mm -hmm. and you can't develop biological <clears throat> drive. And poorly developed people and well-developed people, they have the same biological drive. But beginning to think of desire as an ability. Mm -hmm. 
then it becomes an ability that you can develop. And so many couples say, how do we rekindle the passion of early marriage? And the answer is, you can't. You can never go back. You go forward and you develop a new basis for intimacy and a new basis for desire. So um, one of the things that makes human sexual desire quintessentially human, different from mm -hmm. all over primates, all yeah, other species, yeah. is that we are capable of consciously chosen, freely undertaken desire. Mm -hmm. And that may sound like an odd idea at first, but that's what people want. Mm -hmm. More than they want to, their partner have sex with them because their partner is horny. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People want to be chosen. Mm -hmm. And the only way that you can be chosen is if your partner chooses you. And biology does not choose. Mm -hmm. The mind chooses. Yes. So this book gives couples for the first time not only a chance to solve desire problems, but to have the kind of really robust, long-lasting, meaningful mm -hmm. desire mm -hmm. that couples want. And concerning the mind, there's my last question. Your fourth, chap your fourth chapter is a, little is a little slopey with the reprogramming of the brains overwritten. Yeah. I did not resume on the blog that um, your very practical suggestions for sex. Ah, yes. How do you justify your point of view? Or what do you mean when you suggest the reprogramming of the brain? Oh, uh, you obviously have read the book very, very well. <laughs> Um, part of what makes intimacy and desire unique is it is also the first application of modern brain science mm -hmm. to sexual desire. It's interesting. Yeah, it? very interesting. And it turns out that uh, you can use the body to reprogram the mind and the brain. Mm -hmm. And in intimacy desire are four different activities that we've developed over 30 years. And it also is amazing that simply by two, two people doing a long duration, five to 10 minute hug, in there they produce seven conditions that have been scientifically demonstrated to facilitate positive brain rewiring. Wow. It is amazing, but also that's, you realize there's something beautiful about relationships. Although they're hard, there is an elegance to them that goes beyond anything that the human mind could ever have come up with. Yes. To find that of its own accord, hugging, produces seven conditions that completely not only changes your sex life, it changes your brain. Yes. And when your brain changes, that is how you become a different kind of human being. So couples that have difficulty with temper yeah. or somebody erupting or somebody being chronically depressed, by following the things in the book, we have found people that have fundamentally been able to change their lives as well as their marriages. I would like to, to, to have Uncle uh, 10 or 20 questions more for you. Yes. Das Buch Darf ich schnarch? Intimität und Verlangen, sexuelle Leidenschaft wieder wecken, ist im Frühjahr bei Klettkotter erschienen. Thank you very much for this interview. Oh, it is my pleasure.